All right, uh, so before I begin, uh, I'd like to thank the Kajagua Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak here today, and also thanks to Michele for a glowing introduction, as always. All right, so in gravitational wave astronomy, uh, we want our astrophysical source models to be uh, as close to physical reality as possible, and that's because we want to maximize the overlap between any true signal S and our predicted waveform. Uh, models H. So we do this because uh, we want to actually find and learn about these sources. And so a main team, one of the main teams in data analysis is actually to try and identify the particular waveform which maximizes its overlap with noisy data from detectors. So that's given by S plus N over there. And this gives us information about the uh, source parameters of the signal theta. So there's some common ground between these two areas, and it consists mainly of template models. So I will use the word template uh, to refer to basically parameterized waveform models which are actually fast enough to be used in data analysis. So these uh, template models are constructed either in the time or frequency domain, and that's it. So what I'll propose in this talk is actually to maximize the overlap between these two areas and that's done uh, possibly by, for example, working uh, more natively in some compact template representation, and also possibly by using template derivatives uh, in, uh, in conjunction with derivative-based data analysis algorithms. And possibly we could even try and look for inverse models that uh, directly give us the estimated parameters of any source given some data. So the main motivation for all of this is actually to help us deal with the huge computational challenges uh, in source modeling and data analysis for the future space-based detector, LISA. Right, so LISA is 15 years away from its flight, but uh, actually I think that's actually right around the corner uh, with respect to the amount of work that still remains to be done. So I'll start off by giving a brief overview of the LISA mission and uh, related activities, and then I will summarize the distinctive features of LISA data analysis. And then in the second part of my talk, I will talk uh, more about my proposed strategies, firstly in general, and then with particular focus on extreme mass ratio in spirals, which are particularly problematic. Okay, so LISA stands for the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. So it consists of six inertial test masses, housed inside three spacecraft, which are separated by 2.5 million kilometers. So LISA, uh, the spacecraft, are actually drag-free in the sense that they don't apply forces to the test masses along the interferometer axis, and they communicate with each other via laser transponders. So LISA will be placed in orbit around the sun, trailing the Earth by about 20 degrees, so that animation over there shows the cartwheeling motion of the LISA constellation on its orbit. And the LISA mission will uh, last for at least four years uh, with the possibility of extension up to 10. So LISA is in space because we want to observe the millihertz band of the gravitational wave sky. Basically, uh, specifically from frequencies between 0 0.1 millihertz to up to around 1 hertz. So that falls neatly between the uh, nanohertz sensitivity band of pulsar timing arrays and of course the kilohertz band of uh, that ground-based detectors are sensitive to. So putting a detector in space uh, actually allows us to remove the noise from large-scale changes in the Earth's gravitational field, and also it allows us to go to longer arms, which gives us uh, greater sensitivity at low frequencies. So the lengths of uh, LISA's arms are actually not constant, but uh, what we can do is actually we can process the data using a technique called time delay interferometry, so this gives us essentially three standard interferometric combinations, two of which are Michelson-type interferometers, but with 60 degree instead of 90 degree arms. And these will be used to measure the gravitational wave polarizations in the data. The third interferometer is a Sanyang interferometer, which is a common path configuration that is uh, largely insensitive to gravitational waves and will be used to measure the noise in the data. So funding has been approved for LISA 
uh, which was selected as the third large class mission in ESA's Cosmic Vision program, and it has a scheduled launch date of 2034. So uh, even though that launch date seems pretty far away, it's 15 years away, um, so our work has already actually begun, and uh, the, 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 the priority here is actually to come up with a prototype instrument and data processing framework uh, within five years' time. Uh, and that's when uh, mission adoption will actually take place for implementation. Okay, so here I'll mention uh, the proof of technology mission Visa Pathfinder. So it concluded in 2017 after operating for about one, one and a half years, and it was a resounding success. So LISA Pathfinder uh, consists of two initial masses separated by just 40 centimeters and placed in the same spacecraft. So this spacecraft was in orbit around the Earth Sun L1 Lagrange point, and because of the short separation between the masses, it was not sensitive to gravitational waves. However, uh, what the Pathfinder mission demonstrated was that the drag free technology that will be required for the full LISA mission is actually achievable and feasible. So we did this by measuring the displacement between the test masses to within 0 .1, 0.01 nanometers. So uh, note that this precision is also, uh, doesn't depend on the separation between the masses, and therefore it would be achievable for LISA as well. So impressively, uh, Pathfinder not only uh, attained its own targets, it, uh, in fact, it has achieved the full LISA mission requirements already. So that plot there. Uh, the red curve is the visa noise requirement, and the blue curve is actual pathfinder noise. All right, so preparatory science work uh, for the LISA mission has also begun, and it is uh, being coordinated by the LISA science group. So the LISA science group is led by these two gentlemen over there, basically my old boss and my new boss. Uh, so. <laughs> The LSG uh, is responsible for implementing the scientific vision of the LISA consortium and is also uh, one of three core groups in the consortium, the other two being the instrument group and the data processing group. So the preparatory work is organized into work packages uh, to ensure the eventual delivery of the mission's science goals and products. So in particular, uh, the high priority work packages involve waveform modeling and also the development of a prototype data analysis framework uh, in time for mission adoption. Right, so LISA will be, uh, sorry, the LISA Science Group will be working closely uh, with other associated working groups, such as the Astrophysics, Fundamental Physics, and Cosmology groups. So these uh, will comprise members of the larger gravitational wave community. And for the high priority work packages, uh, it will be dependent on the contributions of members from the waveform, working, waveform and data challenge working groups. So in particular, the data challenge group has uh, recently started a new round of data challenges. So uh, we have made several uh, data sets, toy data sets available publicly online. And uh, it, they are located at their website. So uh, we are calling for submissions currently and everyone is welcome to take a look, download the data and play with it and provide a submission. Okay, so now I'll talk about some key features of LISA data analysis. So there, there will be many sources that evolve throughout the frequency band of LISA. So um, the closest of which are actually compact binaries in our very own galaxy. So these, some of these are already known to exist, and they will be uh, also resolvable in LISA data. So we call them verification binaries uh, because they're expected to be in the data once LISA is turned on. So the verification binaries are indicated on that plot over there by the blue stars. Right, so further out to about one gigaparsec, uh, LISA can also detect LIGO-type binaries, uh, but towards the more massive end and because these are really at lower frequencies. So these are known as the Susanna binaries, and they are indicated on that plot by the, uh, the tracks on the lower right-hand corner. So specifically, GW150914 could also have been uh, potentially observed, detected by LISA, you know, years before its merger in the LIGO band, albeit at uh, lower significance. So further out to 10 gigaparsecs, LISA will see the capture and the in spiral of stellar mass compact objects into 
supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. So these are known as extreme mass ratio in spirals, or MREs for short. And uh, the harmonics of a single emery are indicated by the, the tracks on the lower central part of the plot over there. And finally, out to 100 gigaparsecs, Lisa will see the, uh, uh, the mergers of supermassive black holes that occur when galaxies collide. So these are extremely energetic sources, and therefore they can be observed up to very high redshift. So on the plot over there, they are indicated by, of course, the thick tracks running along the top which have higher amplitude than all the other sources. So we say that the Lisa millihertz band is source rich, but it's also uh, information rich. Some of, the, some of the signals in it can be information rich. And this is because the signals can be very complex. They can have a high degree of amplitude of phase modulation. They can be very strong as well. They could have many cycles or large amplitude. And the combination of these two factors gives the signals uh, higher variability over parameter space, and this leads to the ability to do very precise parameter estimation with them. So as an example, here's a sped up simulation of an emery and its gravitational wave signal running along the bottom. So uh, this only shows the final two months of the emery, but such sources can in general be observed across the full Lisa mission lifetime of years. So clearly there's a lot of phase information in the signal as the compact object spans many orbits in the strong field of the central black hole before finally plunging. All right, so LISA data analysis is difficult, and there are several problems that make it difficult. So uh, one, of, one of them, which I won't really go into too much detail, I won't really address in this talk, is, but in some sense is the most fundamental one, is the problem of modeling the instrument and the noise in the data. So the response of the LISA instrument to a passing gravitational wave is very complicated because it depends on the dynamical orbits of not just the six inertial test masses which form your interferometers, but also the three spacecraft that house them. And, well, the, the evolving arm lengths and the laser phase noise, so these, these uh, forms of noise, they can actually be accounted for largely uh, using the technique of time delay interferometry. Uh, where you take optical path combinations uh, to give you three channels that are orthogonal with respect to the noise. However, uh, this TDI is still currently uh, computationally expensive uh, to apply, and I think we need to find a way to make it faster. Right, so there are other sources of noise in LISA data as well. So uh, these are basically your optical path noise, which occurs at high frequencies and also the acceleration noise from the motion of the detectors, uh, which occurs at low frequencies. So the problem with this noise is that it's going to be non-stationary over the duration of your signals. And this means that when we do our analysis, we will have to use effectively time-evolving noise power spectral density models. We also have to account for transient effects, such as gaps and glitches. So scheduled gaps will occur Every, they will be seven hours long and they will occur every two weeks. Unscheduled ones can last even longer, maybe up to a week. And we can also possibly get glitches that occur both at the high frequency end and the low frequency end, basically throughout the full laser sensitivity band. Okay, so on to the problems that I do want to address. So the first is confusion. So this is basically the fact that LISA data contains a lot of signals that uh, overlap in both the time and frequency domain. So, uh, yeah, so this, this is one instance where actually maximizing the overlap is not really what we want, but nature has done it for us. Uh, so there can be anywhere from 10 to 1,000 supermassive black hole mergers, 10 to 10,000 emeries, and 10,000 to 100,000 resolvable uh, galactic binaries in the data, among other signals. So we can't just find them once, subtract them, and then move on. So this is because it will significantly bias uh, the, the significance of any detections or the accuracy of your parameter estimation. So what is needed is a global solution to this problem. So uh, essentially, this means searching for and analyzing all the signals simultaneously. But when I say uh, simultaneously, I don't really mean fully simultaneously, because that would be impractical. So uh, we can probably get away with just doing separate, the different types of source 
independently because they are largely orthogonal to each other. And right, so the the global fit algorithm will right it will comprise these uh, separate pipelines for the different types of source, and these pipelines will all communicate with each other, and they will also uh, update the existing solution repeatedly and also draw from the existing so solution repeatedly. So this uh, makes streamlining actually more important for all the individual pipelines because we don't want to be held up by a single pipeline. So the second problem is search. So for certain types of Lisa source, the parameter space can be huge. And by huge, I don't just mean in terms of dimensionality, which is up to 20, maybe. Uh, because that's actually the same as we get for LIGO type sources. But I also mean huge in terms of the volume, the information volume of the space. So this uh, information volume is defined with respect to the official information metric. And because of this uh, huge information content in the signals, uh, you can actually get sources where the credible regions are very localized, and therefore they can be very difficult to find during search. So, right, so stochastic algorithms are actually our best uh, bet for coping with this problem. Template banks are going to be pretty much useless. Uh, so these stochastic search algorithms are going to be hierarchical. They're going to, be, uh, they're going to search at different resolutions from coarse grain to fine grain searches. They'll probably still require multiple passes over the data because of the stochastic nature of these algorithms. And the problem here is that even though the number of templates is reduced, uh, it's still a very large number of templates. And each template can be very expensive to generate. And also, the operations that are performed on each template can also be very expensive. So the third problem is accuracy. So for certain types of Lisa source, we will be in the regime where the theoretical error from imperfect modeling actually exceeds the statistical error that you get due to noise. And this will lead to a bias, a systematic bias in your parameter estimates. So this is really going to be only the case for strong fuel sources with very high SNR, where the combination of complexity and strength leads to a very high degree of uh, signal variability over parameter space. Unfortunately, these sources are exactly the most interesting ones and also the most difficult ones to model. So we need to address this problem maybe on different levels. So at the level of the waveform modeling, I guess what we should do is really just do the best we can and have a good understanding of the errors, the intrinsic errors in our waveforms. On the template level, what we want to do is to minimize the loss of accuracy with respect to the best waveforms, but also do it in a way uh, that is still computationally feasible. And there's probably a third way of doing things, which is actually to try and uh, address it from the data analysis side. And this can be done by, for example, accounting for the theoretical error during analysis. So this is something I worked on uh, with Chris Moore and a few others a few years ago. Uh, basically, in this plot, what we see is the likelihood for the chirp mass of a BBH signal. So the black curve is actually the likelihood evaluated with the true uh, template model, uh, accurate template model. And as a result, it's centered on the, the true injection parameters. The orange curve is what you would get if you sampled that likelihood using approximate templates. So that shows you the effect of the systematic bias. And the blue likelihood is where one where we have marginalized over a Gaussian process model for the template error. So this uh, does two things. It sort of reduces the systematic bias by shifting the peak back towards the true value. And it also uh, broadens the peak so as to be more conservative and to not exclude the true parameters at a very high significance. Right. So that's the first part of my talk. Uh, okay, so now I will actually go on to talk about forward models, the inverse problem, and the uh, trouble with these for the particular case of Emery's. So I'll start off by talking about the traditional approach to modeling and inference in gravitational wave astronomy, and I will uh, talk about some proposed strategies for improving this for LISA data analysis. I will then uh, give a brief update on 
the status of Emory modeling and also provide a closer look at the Emory data analysis problem. And finally, I'll end off by suggesting, well, basically giving my opinion on how these problems uh, could actually be solved for Emory's. Okay, so, right, in gravitational wave astronomy, so the template models that we have, they are essentially solutions to what we call the, what we broadly call the forward problem, which is where you find a map from parameters to the expected data. So as I mentioned earlier, these template models are usually in the time or frequency domain. They model the response of a particular detector, H, uh, to a signal with source parameters, theta. So in the forward modeling stage, we also need noise models uh, for the power spectral density of the noise and also transients. But in some sense, the noise models are informed by real data, so you can also think of them as an inverse uh, problem for the solution to an inverse problem for the noise. So the inverse problem, the, the one that we really care about, is uh, finding a map from real data to inferred parameters of any source signal that resides in the data. So this can take the form of point estimates, which could be computed using, for example, maximum likelihood estimation. So this is essentially just maximizing the overlap, finding the template parameters that maximize the overlap between template and data, essentially what a template bank does. Um, but point estimates cannot be the end product. What we really want is credible regions. Uh, so this could be done by um, basically getting a, uh, no, rather these credible regions are computed from a posterior density, P of theta. So that posterior density is obtained by usually sampling from a Bayesian posterior distribution, which is defined from the forward model and also conditioned on the real data. So all that is pretty standard stuff. But let's look at the back of, some back of the envelope numbers for LISA and also the computational implications that it might have. So the LISA data stream is four years at three hertz. So that gives us about 10 to the eight time of frequency samples. So that's about a thousand times longer than the longest signals that LIGO has detected so far. And in fact, it's more comparable to the length of a continuous wave signal in LIGO data. The second problem is that some of these template models can be very expensive to evaluate. They can take up to minutes, especially if uh, we apply the LISA response function, which is currently slow, as I mentioned. And this is also even in the case where we use the fastest possible waveform models, template models that we have. So when we do parameter estimation, we'll need probably up to a billion samples in a single posterior single set of posterior samples. So each of these samples will require a call to the template, which will depend on the individual template cost, which is bad. And it will also uh, depend on an overlap operation with the data, which would depend on the sampling resolution, which is large. And so a billion, this figure of a billion, uh, is bad, but it, it's actually typical of high dimensional problems. Uh, and it's, it's reasonable for local parameter estimation. But uh, these numbers can be much larger in general for search, for global search across parameter space. So this uh, rather ludicrous upper bound of 10 to the 30 that I've placed here is uh, actually the worst case scenario. It's for an M research uh, using a template bank. So you're basically reading the full parameter space with templates. And you will require 10 to the 30 templates. So, uh, yeah, so that's clearly beyond the reach of most, uh, I think even in the future, it will be beyond the reach of most high-performance computing systems. And, uh, yeah, it's, we are no longer in the needle in a haystack situation. I think this is more akin to finding a single cell of bacteria on Earth. Okay. So what I'm proposing in this talk is actually to work in to find some sparse or reduced data representation that actually satisfies uh, several criteria. So, right, so actually there's been a lot of work in LIGO data analysis to reduce computational costs. But I think the, the, the point is that most of these techniques will be even more important for LISA 
uh, where the problem is even greater. So we need to find, really be quite creative about it. Uh, so yeah, the three criteria I'm looking for are that the representation admits native template generation. That two, it should also admit native search and parameter estimation methods. And three, it should be lossless or near lossless when used for parameter estimation. So, time frequency analysis uh, provides a possible uh, alternatives for these sorts of representations. Uh, for example, you can have the short time Fourier transform, which is the first equation on there. The wavelet transform, which is the second equation. So these are, of course, nothing new, but the point is that they are uh, pretty well suited to the purpose of LISA, LISA data analysis. And the reason they are well suited to the problem is that they are, one, they are compatible with the noise weighted overlap, the usual frequency domain overlap, which is given by that third equation over there. So uh, this allows the usual standard statistical framework to be used with uh, very little alteration. The time frequency approach also allows us to deal very well with the non-stationarity and the gaps in, that is present in LISA data. Now for, so these time frequency templates, uh, they can be used in combination with techniques such as heterodyning or bandpass filters uh, in order to really do fast searches across the global parameter space. Uh, I'll beat lossy searches, but still, you can do it fast. And also, they are intrinsically sparse, which uh, provides some near lossless compression if you want to do parameter estimation in this domain. Okay, so <clears throat> another compact uh, representation is provided by the reduced order modeling approach. So, in gravitational wave astronomy, reduced order modeling uh, basically involves taking a, de a dense training set of templates and constructing a reduced basis for the signal space that is spanned by those templates. So this uh, effectively reduces the time frequency representation down to a much lower dimensional vector space. And that's because uh, every template in that span can then be written as the linear combination of the EI, the reduced basis factors. And this reduced basis representation alpha is uh, accurate to machine precision accuracy. So it's, as far as I'm concerned, that's an equal sign. And also, uh, this alpha uh, actually provides optimal compression of the space in some sense because it reflects the true effective dimensionality of the signal space. So what we want to do when we're using the ROM approach in data analysis directly is we want to actually do a one-time projection of the data onto a pre-built reduced basis. And I say one time because we, because the projection is done in the full time frequency representation, so it's actually the expensive part. So we don't want to do that too often. So in order to do that, right, so the projection there is, uh, so you get the projected data on the left, h theta plus n, which projects down onto the reduced, the projected template, alpha theta, plus the projection of noise onto the signal space. But in order to do this, we need to ensure that the reduced basis is linear with respect to the noise-weighted overlap. So that means that the inner product in the reduced space should be equal to the noise-weighted overlap, which is that last equation over there. So this rules out, unfortunately, the, the sort of reduced basis that are used in the numerical relativity surrogates, uh, where they construct reduced basis over amplitude and phase. So these are much smaller. So it's very good, but uh, unfortunately, they are non-linear with respect to the overlap. Another thing to note is that a reduced basis is, on, is only valid over some restricted domain in parameter space. And so if we want to use them for search, we will have to construct many bases uh, in order to cover the parameter space beforehand. Uh, however, uh, the ROM approach does actually provide optimal compression uh, if we want to do parameter estimation in this domain. And this is especially the case if we uh, build the reduced basis over a fairly localized prior region. Right, so, so far I've been talking about doing search and parameter, parameter estimation natively. But uh, remember also that we want to be able to generate templates natively in the representation as well. So in order to avoid computing them in full and then reducing them, which defeats the purpose. 
So uh, to do this, generically, some form of interpolation across parameter space will be required. So in the time frequency domain, uh, part of this interpolation can probably be done analytically. So for example, um, you could, from the amplitude and phase of a template, you could actually directly construct the short time Fourier transform. And so we can actually just stick to the simpler problem of interpolating the smooth amplitude and phase trajectories over parameter space instead. However, there's no such uh, simplicity for the reduced order domain. So here, um, the typical approach that is used is empirical interpolation. So this uh, technique, okay, so in this uh, plot over here, schematically, the reduced basis is represented by the red uh, dots on the horizontal axis. So they uniquely define a, a, a set of frequency nodes of the same size in the frequency domain. So those are given by the blue dots on the vertical axis. And it is the, the, the template values at these particular frequency nodes that are interpolated across parameter space instead. So that, those are the blue lines in the plot. Right, so we don't, so at any given parameter value, we don't really want to reconstruct the full template, which is what is done in the ROM surrogates. What we want to do is we want to take the node values, the, the yellow diamonds, and use them in combination with the projected data to give us the value of the template data overlap directly. So that is the idea behind the reduced order quadrature method. So this ROQ method, unfortunately, is not fully native. Because if I wanted to compute, say, the overlap between two arbitrary uh, templates, uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without additional projections. So uh, Michele, Chad Galley, and I, we have uh, recently come up with a way of doing uh, interpolation in the reduced order domain that is fully native. So our method is dubbed reduced order modeling with artificial neurons, or Roman for short. So it uses a deep neural network to perform the interpolation. And the output of the neural network, given some parameters, is actually the projection coefficients of any template, of the corresponding template. So this, uh, because of its nativity, it gives maximal computational savings. And accuracy-wise, it's also almost comparable to empirical interpolation, and probably can be improved further if we try it a bit harder. Right, so uh, we have explored the feasible feasibility of Roman uh, by building it for uh, a four-dimensional template model for aligned spin binary black holes. So this uh, plot here shows the overlap accuracy of 5,000 test examples scattered across some parameter space, the 4D parameter space, but projected onto the chart mass and symmetric mass ratio plane for visualization purposes. So uh, in that plot, yellow points are good, and black points are overlap of below 0 0.5. So in some particular region of interest, where the mass ratio, uh, we have mass ratios of up to 8, uh, we actually get a median accuracy of 99.5%, which is you know, comparable to empirical interpolation. Right, so a natural byproduct of our Roman networks is uh, we get these fully analytic template derivatives. So template derivatives are rarely, they have rarely been used in gravitational wave data analysis, and that's because they typically must be computed numerically, and that brings about speed and stability issues that you have to worry about. However, I think it's a, probably a good idea to start thinking about how we can actually generate these template derivatives uh, more easily, as done in Roman and also how they can be used in uh, data analysis, derivative-based data analysis algorithms for search and parameter estimation. So uh, for example, we could try uh, this new uh, posterior type of posterior sampling, which effectively does uh, importance sampling. It uses derivatives to do importance sampling on the tangent bundle of the signal manifold. So that's essentially just sampling on a linearized and discretized approximation to the signal space. So this method is very general. Basically, you can use it to upsample a base MCMC chain, uh, which is very short, but almost converged. You can use it to upsample it 
with only the template derivative values at those points. So uh, here I'm presenting the likelihood. I'm sampling the likelihood for a two-parameter model uh, in chirp mass and symmetric mass ratio. So the true, uh, I have an injected signal in the center of the plot. So in the top left panel, we see uh, a high-resolution histogram of a sparse, a very short MCMC base chain with just a few thousand samples. So clearly, that's under-resolved because of the num large number of bins that we're using. And so it's going to be difficult to use it to construct uh, posterior density estimates. Uh, to its right is the, is the histogram for the upweighted samples, sorry, the samples that are obtained using this uh, upsampling method. And uh, below that is a reference MCMC chain with the same number of samples just for comparison. So we can see that the distribution obtained from this uh, derivative based method is uh, pretty good. And also the order of uh, magnitude computational savings that we get in this example. Uh, yeah, th those are pretty useful as well. Right, so that's uh, template derivatives. Right, uh, another possibility is that we can try and construct inverse models. So what I mean by this is solutions to the inverse problem. Uh, so basically giving, uh, specifying some data and recovering either the maximum likelihood estimates or some posterior density estimate, but doing it without using the forward models. So this clearly is going to be difficult because these models are essentially parameterized by noise. And so you can't really construct them in a deterministic way. So what you can do is you can try and learn them, which is really a fancy way of saying we are fitting them to some large representative set of training examples. And right, so deep neural networks are actually, uh, again, they are a pretty good tool for doing this because of the large number of degrees of freedom and also their ability to generalize and extrapolate. So over the past year, there have been a, a number of papers which have used, uh, they've constructed neural network classifiers and they've pre-trained these on templates with expected noise and they're proposing it as a promising solution to LIGO type detection, where it's actually not clear whether a data stream contains a signal or not. So even though uh, in all these papers, they don't explicitly demonstrate it, uh, the networks that they use can actually easily be extended to point estimates. However, the point estimates that they give are not necessarily the maximum likelihood estimates. So they're not really statistically found it in any sense. And in some sense, this is a criticism of deep neural networks in gravitational wave context, is that they are a bit of a black box. Uh, but again, you know, if you know what you're doing, you can actually train your network so that you do recover the maximum likelihood estimates. And I also don't want to go into too much details here, but Michele and I think that now it might be possible to do posterior learning with uh, such networks. So what I mean by this is to uh, obtain the posterior density estimate given some data, uh, but without actually computing any posteriors during the training stage. So uh, yeah, so we have some preliminary results which look pretty good. Uh, that's just comparing the output of the neural network posteriors to uh, the one-dimensional marginalized true posteriors. Right. Uh, so all these, uh, it's still early days for all these methods, uh, but the hope is that eventually deep learning and neural networks, they will become, uh, they will eventually prove to be useful for these uh, search and parameter estimation, especially uh, in com uh, when used in combination with the reduced representations that I've talked about. Okay, so now on to the trouble with extreme mass ratio in spirals. So MREs, they are the capture of stellar mass compact objects by supermassive black hole in galactic nuclei. So those that emit in the LISA band will have about 10,000 to about 100,000 observable orbits uh, deep within the strong field of the central black hole. So this results in extreme versions of pre uh, precession, such as periapsis precession, lens turing precession. And also the orbit can also retain significant amount of eccentricity all the way up to plunge. So there are also many unknowns 
in modeling the astrophysics of Emrys. Uh, for example, uncertainties in the supermassive black hole mass function or the fraction of SMBHs that are hosted in dense stellar cusps or even the, the, the individual Emry rate per massive black hole as well. So as a result of all these unknowns, um, the actual number of uh, Emrys that will be observed, the estimated number of Emrys that will be observed in LISA data is, it actually spans about three orders of magnitude. So we could see anywhere from tens to 10,000. Uh, so that's poorly modeled, unfortunately. So for the waveform modeling itself, we can't use numerical relativity, at least not yet, not that I'm aware of. Uh, and this is because of the differing, uh, the greatly differing scales of length, mass, and time in the system. So the best approach here is actually to use black hole perturbation theory uh, using the small mass ratio as the perturbation parameter. So this works well because uh, the orbit of the compact object is essentially uh, close to being geodesic in the extreme mass ratio limit. So the compact object, its gravitational view causes a small perturbation on the space-time of the background black hole. So this perturbation can be expressed as uh, an effective gravitational self force that acts on time-like curvature geodesics. So for LISA purposes, the, because of the amount of precision that we require, uh, we will need these Emory waveforms to be phase accurate up to 1 over SNR radians, where SNR, typical SNRs for Emory's are anywhere between 10 and 100. So that's a great amount of precision and to, in order to do this, we need to be able to compute the gravitational self force, uh, all the terms up to the dissipative second order self force. Right, so here's an inventory of the waveform models that uh, exist currently or are under development. So the most accurate ones that we have so far are the adiabatic waveforms. So at adiabatic order, we can uh, compute these waveforms by solving the Tchaikovsky equation for scalar perturbations on Kerr. So uh, these, unfortunately, don't even uh, contain the full self-force effects. They only contain the orbit averaged first order dissipative self-force. And also, even then, they are way too expensive to be used directly in data analysis. That's why I've classified them as waveform models, not template models. So the next leading order effect is that of transient resonances. So uh, there are no complete models that include these effects, but we are starting to understand them a bit. So transient resonances are essentially these uh, short time scale changes in the trajectories of the Emrys, uh, not the orbital trajectories, the phase trajectories. And uh, this is caused by the concurrence of the different orbit, the three different orbital frequencies on a curved geodesic. Right, so for LISA parameter estimation, we will need the self force waveforms up to post one adiabatic order, and calculations are still ongoing on that front. What's the expansion parameter? Small mass ratio. Sorry? How does it count beyond the adiabatic? How, how does it count beyond well, adiabatic? You say post one half adiabatic. So that adiabatic is post zero adiabatic. Okay. And yeah, but it's actually first order, roughly. It's complicated. There are like dissipative terms and conservative terms, so they come in at different orders. But at post one adiabatic, they will include uh, second order dissipative, first order conservative. Yeah. So it's one half is a square root, has a square root. Has a square root, yeah. So post half adiabatic comes in at order roughly 1.5 in the mass ratio, yeah. So while the self force community uh, is doing these calculations, the data analysis community uh, has made use of hybrid models uh, known as kludges. So these uh, make various approximations in order to speed things up. So in order of uh, the chronological development, uh, these kludges are the analytic kludge of Barak and Cutler, which is very fast to evaluate, but uh, it's, it has inaccurate frequencies. The numerical kludge of Babak et al. So this is uh, actually fitted to the adiabatic Tchaikovsky waveforms, but uh, unfortunately they are still a bit slow to generate. And the third uh, is the augmented analytic kludge, which, which is a sort of middle ground, where uh, we do some fits to the numerical kludge, but also we retain the speed of the analytic kludge. 
So that plot over there, uh, the top part of it shows the rapid defacing of the analytic kludge with respect to the numerical kludge, and this is corrected by the augmented analytic kludge in the bottom part of the plot. So recently, there's been a, a, a template model which, is, which uses uh, near identity transforms, so, and they use uh, self force information, and the nice thing is that it's also almost as fast as the kludges. However, this model uh, currently only incorporates the first-order self-force information and only for Schwarzschild orbits. But uh, so Martin Vandermeen and Niels Warburton, they have constructed these uh, models with uh, the idea that you can easily incorporate second-order self-force, curved self-force information as it becomes available. All right, so now let me try and put the Emory problem in a bit of context by comparing it to two other types of important, two, two other important types of source for LISA, namely the galactic binaries and the supermassive black hole mergers. So for galactic binaries, confusion is the main problem, right? So population synthesis models predict that there are about more, millions, actually, of uh, galactic binaries that emit uh, in the LISA band. So uh, these, most of these will actually not be, they are too weak, to be resolvable, and so they will form a background of confusion noise. Those that are resolvable can still have a significant frequency overlap, and therefore all of these binaries must be searched for and analyzed simultaneously. So the search for these binaries uh, involves looking for many, many uh, low signal-to-noise ratio signals, so that's difficult, but uh, it's helped by the fact that the template models are very inexpensive. And that's because modeling them is easy. These are weak source, uh, weak fuel sources, and they are nearly monochromatic in terms of the radiation they emit. Right, so conversely, for supermassive black hole mergers, modeling is the difficult part because these waveforms are very complex. We have, to do, uh, we have to use numerical relativity to do them. And as a result also of these complex waveforms, the, the templates that we actually use to perform the search can be quite expensive as well, and also the credible regions can be pretty localized in parameter space. On the good side, uh, these signals have very high signal-to-noise ratio, so what you can do is actually use um, alternative detection type techniques, such as burst type detection, uh, so you don't actually have to use match filtering all the time, and also there are fewer signals to find in the first place. So because of these two factors, and also because of the fact that the frequency evolution of each source is so distinctive, uh, there's basically no confusion whatsoever. We don't have to worry about that. So for Emery's, search is difficult because the templates, as mentioned earlier, are expensive. The, the posteriors are also going to be very highly localized in parameter space. This has to do with the information problem that I was talking about. The signals are not that strong. They are of moderate integrated SNR. And there are possibly many of them to find, maybe even up to 10,000. Modeling is also difficult for Emrys for reasons I've uh, gone into previously. So this is because we need uh, very accurate, we need a high degree of accuracy, but also uh, we also need to make use of very expensive self-force calculations that we don't even have right now at the moment. So the last problem of confusion, that is still pretty much an unknown. And uh, right, so the main reason is because it's, so far it's been very difficult to explore the full parameter space because of the computational constraints. And also there's a lack of uh, actual self force waveforms with which to do it anyway. So hopefully, maybe, uh, this won't really be a problem because uh, these Emory signals are so sensitive to changes in parameters that it's actually hard to imagine that you might have two sources which produce signals with significant overlap. However, there has been some evidence for parameter degeneracy in these signals. Uh, this, is, this evidence is uh, from previous rounds of the LISA data challenge and is also in uh, current work that I'm doing with Kurt Cutler. So in this figure here, we are looking at posteriors for the six intrinsic parameters of an emery, namely from left to right, uh, the semi-lattice rectum, compact object mass, uh, central black hole mass, 
central black hole spin, eccentricity of the orbit, and the inclination angle of the orbit with respect to the spin. So this, uh, these posteriors were done, uh, were obtained with an approximate likelihood, and they were also obtained with an approximate waveform, which is the an augmented analytic kludge that I mentioned earlier. So the true injection parameters are centered again in the center of the plots, where the true peak resides, and these are found by our sampling algorithms. However, we also find uh, four secondary peaks, and these, these secondary peaks actually reside in a pretty small prior region. So the region is about 10 sigma, which sounds big, but actually it's not. It's, a, it's really a very small patch of the full parameter space. But even in such a small patch, we have found four secondary peaks, each of which contains signals that can have overlap with the true signal of greater than 0 0.5. So this uh, could be a problem because um, you know, they might be mistaken for actual signals when you're doing the search. And I think more investigation is required on this front uh, in order to determine whether these uh, degeneracies are actually going to be there or whether you know, they are just an artifact of the approximate waveform and likelihood that we are using. Right, so finally, um, so my thoughts on how we can actually go about solving the Emory problem. Uh, so in keeping with the theme of this talk, I want to maximize the overlap. So I'm not talking just about the modeling and the inference techniques that I've talked about earlier. I'm also talking about maximizing the overlap between the Salesforce and data analysis communities. So currently, there is more communication, uh, especially with the preparatory science work that uh, is being you know, formally undertaken by the LISA science group. Um, but currently, the two communities are still a bit disconnected. So let's try and improve that. So specifically, I think uh, the time frequency domain approach for MREs is particularly promising. So um, for example, the near identity transform models that I mentioned earlier, uh, these could be used to generate fast trajectories uh, once we get an interpolant for the Kerr cell force. So these trajectories could then possibly feed into uh, some map to the short time Fourier transform. So this map could be done by using interpolation methods such as Roman. And once you have these STFT templates, you can then uh, straightforward to apply the frequency domain, the LISA response in the frequency domain, uh, although that model is currently a bit slow and will have to be uh, made more computationally efficient. So with a fast STFT template for an Emory, you can do semi-coherent searches where you divide the data up into short segments and you search over each, uh, but analy uh, analytically maximizing over attitude, phase, time, etc. So uh, that's a possibility for search. For parameter estimation, you can use the STFT templates directly as well by just comparing them with the STFT of the data. And because it's a lossless transform, you don't lose anything. So as an added bonus, most of these steps here in this procedure are uh, embarrassingly parallelizable. So uh, in some sense, it's not hard to see that if we want to actually uh, streamline things even further, uh, it's pretty easy to do so. Right, so all of these uh, work and these ideas that I've presented in this talk uh, actually fall under a LISA science group work sub-package that I'm coordinating, which is probably why I'm thinking about them in the first place. Uh, so this sub-package is uh, it's related to the development of efficient Emory models. So it will act as a bridge between two other sub -packag uh, work packages, sub work sub packages, uh, one of which being the Emory waveform development package and the other being the Emory data analysis pipeline package. So uh, I've identified uh, several categories of project that might uh, help us to achieve the aims of this work package. And uh, they are listed here so um, most of them are pretty high priority, should be completed within five years or so. But uh, in particular, the implementation, the first one, the implementation of kludges and the related tools for the ongoing LISA data challenges, that should be completed uh, within two. So I'm currently calling for expressions of uh, interest or commitment from anyone who might want to be involved or who is already working on such projects. So there's no need uh, to be a full or even an associate member of the LISA consortium, um, although we do encourage it for bookkeeping purposes. 
And in any case, if, if you're going to be working on these types of projects anyway, it doesn't, there's no harm uh, signing up as an associate member. There are no commitments at this stage. Uh, so more information is available at this website, tinyurl.com slash emery-templates. And of course, you can just get in touch with me if uh, you have any related questions. Right, so in summary, uh, the space-based millihertz gravitational wave detector LISA is being developed for launch in 2034. So a prototype data analysis framework is required within the next five years in time for mission adoption. So there are many computational challenges uh, involved with LISA source modeling and data analysis, some of which I've talked about in this talk. And uh, I'm proposing that we work in sparse, reduce, sparse or reduced data representations and also to try and adopt other strategies which might help the problem. And finally, uh, for EMRIs, which is a problematic case, I think maximizing the overlap is a good mantra to follow. And uh, for EMRI work, there's a lot that remains to be done. Uh, thank you.